Hey guys, Jamie Lynn here, and today we are telling the little story of Chase Patrick's birth story. And I'm so excited that you guys are here today to hear this story because it's really overdue that I tell it. So Chase was actually born in the fallout of Hurricane Michael, and it was a really wild and crazy experience because I was pregnant, evacuated from a hurricane at 37 weeks, also was on the emergency management team for the city of Destin, waiting all night, watching the path of this hurricane, trying to decide if I had made the right decision to evacuate to Destin and wait by my work, or if I was totally out of my mind and should have gone clear to Mississippi, and it was a nightmare. So if you guys wanna hear a story about having a baby in the fallout of a hurricane in the hospital that was actually the designated um, like FEMA fallout hospital for all of the victims of Hurricane Michael or the people that were at the hospital in Mexico Beach or Panama City Beach that were actually transferred to my hospital, that's the story, girl. So if you guys have followed my story long, um, Chase Patrick is my third baby. He is the first baby that I had with my husband, now Brandon. Um, Brandon and I were not married at the time when I had Chase. Actually, we were both going through like a really, really bad, hard time. Um, our families didn't like each other, so his family didn't like me, my family didn't like him, and consequently, like we weren't even living together. We went through some really, really bad times. That's not something that I really wanna get too into in this video. It's is part of Chase's birth story, and it is what it is. It's an experience that's in the past. You know, Chase's birth story is kind of a wild one, honestly. In fact, I should have maybe considered naming him Chase Michael as a result, but nonetheless, he is Chase Patrick. So if you guys are here for the first time, welcome. I am so happy that you're here. We have a really growing, badass community of really cool parents, moms and dads alike. Everybody here is welcome, and I'm so happy that you've stumbled upon my channel. Please hit the like button so that this story gets boosted up into the algorithm because other parents that might be dealing with the stress of being pregnant during a hurricane, especially one as catastrophic as Hurricane Michael, that is a devastating and scary, overwhelming experience. So if maybe this story can ease their minds, I actually had a really, really good experience at the hospital despite being a FEMA hospital for Hurricane Michael. Um, so I hope that that actually alleviates some fears of some of the other mothers out there that are expecting right now and maybe are in the path of a hurricane, a major hurricane like I was. So my experience starts in 2018, obviously in October of 2018, Hurricane Michael devastated Me Mexico Beach and Panama City Beach and I was next door to there in Dustin, Florida. I at the time was an emergency management team member. Um, being that I am in IT, I was working in the IT department for the city manager's office for the city of Destin. I no longer work there, but it was one of my most beloved and favorite jobs that I've ever held. And I was really grateful to be there. I stayed across the street at the Palms. If you guys are familiar with Destin, you probably know about the Palms. Brandon and I stayed in the Palms and we actually were like, they're overlooking the building because in the event that we did lose power, I was responsible for bringing the servers back online and getting our network running or possibly making sure that other members of the emergency management team would be able to be in contact with the county and state of Florida. When I was pregnant with Chase, throughout my pregnancy, I never had any complications except for one constant bother. And that was that Chase always was measuring too small. Therefore, I was getting ultrasounds constantly. And it was really annoying that I constantly had to have these ultrasounds and blood work and nothing ever showed to be abnormal except for Chase's size. And we could never figure out why. It was super frustrating and it was obviously concerning. Um, on top of that, I wasn't gaining a lot of weight, but I always chalked it up to just some, the amount of stress that I was under, like working full time, I was trying to buy a car, I was going through like all of these like really stressful things like Brandon and my family not getting along and a lot of the stress that was kind of just 
um, byproduct of that. And you know, it caused strain on Brandon and my relationship, but luckily throughout the entire thing, Brandon and I um, remained true to each other and we really wanted to bring Chase into this world, into a happy and loving home. And so we were really trying to ensure that that was going to happen. As the end of my pregnancy closed in at around 37 weeks hurricane michael was projected to devastate the emerald coast of florida where i lived we were pretty sure of the path and we were pretty sure that it was going to make a sharp turn um and not hit dustin directly head on and just kind of skirt right under us but that the effects of the storm should still be pretty devastating at the time, Brandon and I weren't living together. I was living with my mom and he was living a few blocks away in a condo that we used to live together um, on the water in a nearby uh, city. And we were under evacuation just due to being in the flood zones. So we actually did evacuate to, like I said, the Palms of Destin so that I could be able to be near my work. My boss was actually not in town at the time. He was out on, I don't know, some other, maybe vacation, I'm not sure, but he wasn't in town while all of this was taking place. So that was kind of nerve wracking for everybody, but I felt confident that I was going to be able to meet the city's IT needs despite my current condition of being 37 weeks pregnant. Now I had always heard these tales about how barometric pressure dropping may induce labor. So I had my full hospital bag packed now, unfortunately, that hospital bag was what I used to evacuate to the palms with, and I also had brought Chase's bag with me. Now, as the storm started to get closer to the coast, I started to panic and wonder if I had made the right move, because in the event that the storm did not turn and had not hit Mexico Beach and Panama City Beach and had hit hit Dustin head on, it would have decimated the area. If you guys are familiar with Dustin, it is a very small strip of land completely surrounded by water, but it is only a mile in width. So that small mile would have been completely obliterated had Michael actually hit us head on. So in the event that a hurricane does get too close at 39 miles per hour sustained winds they are instructed to close the bridges which meant that i would have been stuck there in dustin and had i gone into labor i would not have been able to get to the hospital where i was supposed to give birth i would have had to go to a different hospital and it would have completely changed my birth plan which was very nerve-wracking fortunately for us um but not so fortunately for mexico beach and panama city Michael did hit them head on and it did have catastrophic and devastating effects, including loss of life and permanent damage to those areas. Um, those areas are still undergoing regrowth and redevelopment and they are some places um, completely uninhabitable. Barometric pressure dropping did definitely cause me to have a couple of contractions, but not enough to put me into labor. However, there was one other noticeable effect that I started to notice. I did return to work and I did work a few days and made sure that everything was up and running the way it was supposed to be. But I did start noticing that Chase was no longer moving. This was extremely concerning. Chase had always been a very, very active baby in utero and now he wasn't moving at all and I began to panic. I knew that I had an appointment first thing Monday morning and so I did know that Chase was alive because I felt him get the hiccups on one day um, and that was a normal thing, but the fact that we couldn't get him to move, even like if Brandon would touch my stomach and talk to Chase, he always before had a reaction and would always move or kick or move around. And even if I was like moving my stomach or poking at him, he wasn't moving at all. And I was really fearful that something was terribly wrong. I went into my, before I went into my appointment Monday, I was texting Brandon because now it was day four of Chase not moving at all. 
and I was beside myself. Like I was actually crying the morning before my appointment and I was worried that something was terribly wrong. I was starting to like overthink all the times that I had been told that Chase was too small and thinking like maybe something was wrong this whole time and maybe he had passed away or something really terrible was happening and causing him not to move anymore. So I was like doing downward dog poses and like going upside down and doing like really dramatic things to get Chase to move, but nothing that I did was getting Chase to move whatsoever. So Brandon picked me up and we went in for my appointment and I informed the doctor immediately. I was like, listen, Chase isn't moving and I'm really concerned that something is wrong. Um, they sent me in for an ultrasound and luckily Chase was alive and his stats were looking really, really good. However, they said they were worried that Chase was extremely small and might not even be five pounds. Therefore, they sent me next door immediately to the hospital to be induced. So of course I had to use my entire hospital bag during the evacuation for Hurricane Michael and I didn't have anything packed. Everything was dirty, everything was in the laundry. I hadn't even washed it yet. I was still, you know, busy working and doing all these things and I had not yet prepared again a hospital bag. So I had to call my mom and tell her to bring me all sorts of items and clothes and underwear and all these things that I was going to need, which you know, sucked that I didn't feel prepared at all, but you know, it is what it is. So my mom rushed over to the hospital with all of my things and for the next couple of days, her and Brandon stayed by my side and supported me and I was really, really grateful for that. So the first thing that the hospital did was they gave me a dose of Cervidil. Cervidil is something that they put um, directly onto your cervix and it's supposed to help ripen the cervix and soften it and get it ready for dilation um, because I wasn't dilated at all yet. I was 37 weeks, um, but my body was not yet ready to go into labor. So now, if you guys recall, obviously um, the hospital that I was staying at was one of the designated hospitals to send patients to. It was one of the closest ones um, to the destruction of Mexico Beach and Panama City Beach. So therefore, the life flight was going constantly, bringing in patients from that hurricane, people that had either been hurt or people that were just hospitalized there already and needed to be transferred to a hospital that had power and that wasn't, you know, physically falling apart. So we constantly were hearing the helicopter from Life Flight bringing in new patients and patients were constantly being brought in. The other good thing though was that we had tons of FEMA nurses that were there and I had really excellent care. So this is something that if you are somebody that is going to give birth during a hurricane or you're going to be giving birth at a facility that is one of the designated areas to bring in victims or patients from that storm, um, I do want this to be something that makes you feel comforted that these nurses were just top level. They were so accommodating. They were really, really polite. They were so helpful and they were really, really wonderful to me. And they were very nice to my mom and to Brandon. And I was really grateful for, for them, honestly. Um, so they gave me a Cervidil and that lasted about 12 hours. Uh, I didn't feel any contractions or anything from that and I was expecting to be going into labor anytime soon. Sometime during the night, they took the Cervidil out and then they waited about an hour and then started me on Pitocin with my IV. Now I had been on an IV drip the entire time already. So they gave me an IV. Baby? And this is Kalina, by the way. They gave me an IV with some Pitocin and again, I just expected to be going into labor anytime. So at this time, I was kind of heavy into um, practicing the law of attraction. So I was really trying to utilize that to really kind of go into this mind over matter and really um, get my body and my mind all to cooperate and go into labor. I was praying a lot. I was really meditating. I was really trying to calm down myself because I felt in a really bad place. Everything felt really, really chaotic. Nothing felt on my terms. 
Previously, I had given birth at home to my daughter, Una, and that experience was really wonderful and really ideal. And then again, I gave birth at a birth center to my son, Killian, and that experience was so perfect. And even though I knew I wasn't gonna have an experience as good as those two, I wasn't really prepared to be in a hospital, especially one that had life flight constantly going, that had patients, in you know sitting in halls or in beds in hallways and that experience was really overwhelming to me and I felt in this constant state of like disarray and I just couldn't really focus on you know what I was there for and what I was there to do and, and why I was there to like bring a, a new person into this world I truly felt like I could never get my body and my mind to sync up and for me to get into a place where my body felt comfortable going into labor. And I really blamed myself a lot for that. I went through Pitocin and by the late afternoon of the next day, like nothing was happening. I wasn't getting more than a couple of contractions. They were never consistent. Nothing was ever really you know connecting the dots weren't connecting and i just wasn't going into labor and i was just flipping exhausted and overwhelmed and i really felt like i was blaming myself and you know i, I was putting a lot of pressure on myself and, and i was constantly telling the nurses and my doctor like how you know I was going to be a good sport about everything, how I wanted to have a, a natural birth. I hadn't been giving any pain medicine at all because that was my desire and everyone was doing such a great job supporting me and knowing that I wanted a natural birth and, and doing what I asked them to and you know and I was trying to you know likewise be really really good back to them and tell them all how grateful I was and I was but I just I just couldn't go into labor and it was so frustrating. So by the end of the second day that I had been in the hospital, um, I kind of talked to my nurses and I said, hey, why don't we try a different plan since I've already gone through like two whole bags of Pitocin or two doses or whatever. Why don't maybe we just shut the machines down and just disconnect me for a little bit and I'll go for a walk up and down the hall, maybe bounce around. Also that morning at like 8.30 a.m., my doctor had ruptured my water bags and he was sure that that was going to get me going into labor and that that was going to start the contractions but again nothing happened so now my water bags are ruptured chase's head is literally just like sitting on my cervix and i'm just overwhelmed i'm exhausted i'm sore i'm uncomfortable and it's just a mess so after around dinner time, they probably disconnected me from everything. They stopped the Pitocin for a while. They stopped my IV and they actually said that they were also going to let me eat. So Brandon and I walked up and down the hallway and I tried to just kind of get into like a good mindset and like a good place. Like this is where it's going to happen. We're going to do this. We're going to do the damn thing. My body's going to go into labor. It's going to happen. We're going to get there. And I was trying to be really positive. I was bouncing around doing some jumping jacks like being silly and Brandon and I were trying to comfort each other and just still nothing was really happening so I got back to my room and my mom helped me shower and while I was showering Brandon went to a local Wendy's and I'm you know I don't know how many of you know this but I'm plant-based and I don't really eat meat I'm vegetarian so Brandon went to Wendy's and he got me some french fries and a baked potato and even though I'm kind of dairy free at this moment, like I think I ordered the baked potato with like some chives and sour cream, something like that. And well, Wendy's forgot to put all that stuff into the bag. So all I got was a plain old baked potato, my first meal in like two days. Cause I hadn't eaten, you know, prior to going to the hospital the day before. Um, it's my first meal in two days and it's a, just a plain ass baked potato, like a russet potato, just plain. No butter, no salt, no pepper. Luckily I had some french fries, so I downed those french fries, girl, you know I did. I didn't get a drink or anything and I'm like suffering. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So I think the nurse's station managed to like dig up some salt and pepper for my potato but i'll tell you what that was the most disappointing thing that i've ever experienced was not eating for two days 
being in this terrible situation where literally my mom and Brandon are sleeping on the floor, on the tile floor, and I'm having my first meal in two days and it's a plain ass russet potato with nothing. And I'm devastated, <laughs> like freaking devastated. So anyway, um, after I eat and have had my shower, uh, the nurses come and hook me back up to the Pitocin and I'm like, all right, I just am so exhausted that uh, thankfully I just fall asleep and I'm like, this has to happen. I'm gonna wake up in labor tonight. I'm gonna wake up in labor tonight. It's gonna happen. And um, so I go to sleep that night and I start waking up through the night and I'm getting cold. I'm starting to feel really chilly. And I'm telling my mom to turn the heat up in the room and I'm asking the nurses for extra blankets and they're still coming in and out and taking my temperature every hour like Thank they're you. supposed to. Yeah, baby. And they're noticing um, kind of what I'm saying and that is that I'm starting to develop a low-grade fever. Hi, princess. I'm starting to develop a low-grade fever and um, Anybody that knows, once your water bags are ruptured, that's really that's really a deal breaker and that's not a good sign. And especially since we're starting to approach, like by the time it gets to the next morning, we're hitting 24 hours of ruptured water bags. So that is a danger for infection. So I kind of know what's coming before my doctor even tells me. So he comes in the next morning after the nurses have told him. It's like 5, 5.30 in the morning and the nurses are telling him, you know, obviously my fever is, I've got a low grade fever now. Um, he checks to see if I'm dilated at all and I'm not. I'm like a three. It's pathetic. So it's pretty much. It's been about 48 hours that I've been in the hospital. It's been about almost 48 hours since my water bags have been ruptured. Nothing's happening. I'm not going into labor. I haven't had more than like 10 contractions. So obviously he tells me what I fear is happening and coming. And that is that we are going to be performing an emergency C-section as soon as possible. So I'm like, so obviously I'm somebody that's like a natural birth advocate. I'm really thinking back to those experiences I have with my other children. I feel really disappointed and upset and, um, but I am grateful that, you know, everybody gave me the experience that I had had so far and that, you know, they had really tried to let me go into labor on my own. And I was really grateful for that. You know, the Pitocin just didn't work and it sucked, but it is what it is. And that's just, you know, the way that things happened. And so I knew I was going to have a C-section and I just kind of, you know, tried to calm myself down and relax and just, you know, say some prayers and just get prepared. So they take me back into that operating room where they perform the C-sections and they prep me. Super nervous. I don't really like medical things. I get very anxious and I get very, um, sweaty and uncomfortable and my heart rate spikes and all sorts of terrible things. In some instances I've even fainted and lost consciousness because those experiences are just like really uncomfortable for me. It's just, I don't know. I'm just a weirdo. What can I say? So I'm really trying to calm myself down by just like giggling or telling funny stories or, you know, over talking to the nurses and I don't know, just anything that I can to try to calm myself down. Um, since I hadn't had any pain meds up to that point, that was a good thing. They gave me a spinal, um, to, you know, spinal block to block my nerves. And so I wasn't able to feel anything from my chest down. Once that had been completed, they brought Brandon into the room and he was able to be with me for the entire surgery. So Brandon was back there and they began the surgery. Um, they cut me open and Chase immediately kind of tucked back up underneath one of my ribs and he didn't want to come out. So um, one of the surgeons had to press down on my, on my rib cage, which was horrible because I like couldn't breathe. I was like, <gasps> I could feel that. And he had to push down where Chase was hiding to try to push Chase out from under there while my doctor reached up and he was like rummaging around. I mean, you can tell someone's like, like 
fiddling in your insides. It was a terrible experience. And he finally got Chase and he pulled him out. Oh my gosh, what an experience. That took like seven minutes. They say like C-sections, oh, it's like a minute. They're in and out so fast. Hell no, girl. They were like digging in me for like seven minutes. So then after Chase is out, um, I keep hearing the doctor saying, true not, true not, true not. And I don't really understand what he's saying. But what I found out was that Chase had actually tied his umbilical cord into a true knot. So for instance, if this is your umbilical cord, Chase had tied it, he had gone through his umbilical cord, and that, my friends, was the reason why he stopped moving, and that, my friends, is the reason why he wasn't gaining weight and wasn't keeping up and putting as much weight on as he should have is because his umbilical cord flow was limited because he had a true knot in it. The first thing that we noticed was that he wasn't really crying. He was like trying to cry, but he couldn't quite cry all the way. He was like almost like coughing or something. And so they actually put him into the NICU originally for breathing issues, but also he had to be in the NICU because we had that low grade fever. So we had, um, as they came to find out, he was put in the NICU and they did some blood sampling and he actually had streptococcus mitis, which is just a low grade form of strep, which is why we had that fever. So he was treated for that with antibiotics. Um, the breathing issues resolved really quickly. They were probably resolved within 40 minutes. And then, um, you know, I was moved into a recovery room, which was pretty difficult because I wasn't able to hold my baby right after he was born. I wasn't able, I wasn't able to hold Chase and I really feel like that was so difficult to bond with him. It's really difficult to bond with a baby after a C-section, especially if they're being moved into a NICU room. So I had to go back and work on my own recovery and then try to get myself into a position where I was better, where I could start pumping milk for Chase and start um, walking again because you have to wait for all the feeling to come back. You have to you know, wait for use of your limbs again after you have that spinal, which is about two hours. And so once all of that finally started working again and I was able to get myself better and get back into a better spot, by the afternoon I was able to go see Chase for the first time finally. And he still was um, being monitored so I wasn't able to hold him for the first time until I think it was like his 10 o'clock feeding that night. I was finally able to hold my baby for the first time and he was born at 7.40 a.m. on October 17th, 2018. 7.40 a.m. and I didn't get to hold him until like 10 p.m. So that was really, really difficult. Yeah. <laughs> that was so difficult, but you know, it is what it is. He's happy and healthy and safe. So Chase ended up being in the NICU, um, going through, are you singing right now? Are you gonna sing right now? So Chase went through a seven day, <laughs> Chase went through a seven day treatment of antibiotics to treat his streptococcus mitis. Um, once he was off of the antibiotics, because he was born at 37 weeks, that is considered a preemie. So he did have to meet all these standards for how much he was supposed to eat in a day in order to be cleared and graduate from the NICU. So he graduated the NICU on October 28th, 2018, and Brandon and I got to stay in the overnight room with him. It was like the best and most overwhelmingly happy experience because having a baby in the NICU is so stressful. It's so emotionally heart-wrenching. Going home empty-handed without your baby is a very, very, very difficult thing for a parent. That is really hard to go through. And so if you are a parent in that position, I absolutely understand how your heart feels and how difficult that is for you. And I'm really, really sorry if you are going through that situation because it is so difficult. Um, but it is for the better and your child is in a very good place and I can promise you that. So 
being able to stay in the overnight room with Chase and then bring him home the next day was probably like one of the best feelings that I had had in years. And Chase has just been such a blessing and such a gift to our family. He had such outstanding care in the NICU. He had one of the greatest doctors that I had just ever, ever, ever met. She was brilliant and she was really so helpful and able to help us understand all everything that he was going through. She explained things to us so that normal people could understand medical lingo that wouldn't normally understand it. And it was just so wonderful that she was there to take care of Chase and his nurses were just some of like just the most amazing angels I have ever met. So overall, the birth experience that Chase had was overwhelming. It was kind of scary. It was chaotic, um, but in the end, like we're so grateful for our little crazy, crazy boy. And now that he's over two years old, you know, this video is definitely overdue, but I had to eventually share it with all of you guys because I just hope that somebody can take something from my experience of giving birth, you know, during the fallout of a hurricane, especially one that catastrophic. Um, you know, being able to cope with having a C-section for the first time and having a baby in the NICU for the first time. These were all experiences that I never expected to have, but they all happened and they all happened to me at the same time. But we're so grateful, you know, that we have our little boy and now also our little girl. Um, so again, guys, I'm so grateful if you stayed and listened to this whole experience. I'm so grateful for you. And we're so happy to have you here and are you grateful to you? Oh good. So guys, thank you so much for watching and listening to Chase's birth story today. We're so grateful for all of you. Um, thank you so much. Please like and subscribe and have a wonderful day. I love you all. Bye. Say bye-bye. Bye-bye. Say bye-bye. Bye bye. Try diaper. Yeah, I did. Try diaper. Yeah. What?